That's, thank you. مساء الخير بالجميع سوف نبدا بعد قليل شكرا Buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a comenzar esta junta en un momento. Gracias. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to FCPS's Community Town Hall. I'm Tracy Wynn, Director of Community Relations. This event is being recorded and it's also being streamed live to our Facebook page. We'll have American Sign Language interpretation, which will be pinned to the screen. It will only show on a computer, though, not on a mobile device or a tablet. We also have Arabic, Korean, and Spanish interpretation available tonight. Our language interpreters will now introduce themselves. مساء الخير لجميع المنضمين إلينا لهذه الأمسية للاجتماعات المتعلقة بالقرارات بخصوص ارتداء الكمامة أنا اسمي زينة وسوف أساعدكم بالترجمة للغة العربية بعد أن يتحدث المترجم الكوري والمترجم الإسباني سيقوم المضيف بتمكين ميزة الترجمة الفورية التي ستظهر في أسفل الشاشة يمكنك النقر فوق زر الترجمة الفورية الممثل بالكرة الأرضية لاختيار اللغة المبغاة وستسمع الترجمة الفورية الخاصة ب بحجم 80% واللغة الإنجليزية بحجم 20% ويرجى العلم بأن هذه الندوة سوف يتم تسجيلها وبثها مباشرة على الفيسبوك وشكرا 안녕하십니까 오늘 타운홀 미팅에 오신 여러분들 모두 환영합니다. 저는 한국어 지원 서비스 통역을 돕겠습니다. 진행자가 오늘 저녁 통역 기능을 켜면 여러분 스크린 아래쪽에 지구 모양의 통역 버튼이 보일 것입니다. 통역 버튼을 눌러 원하는 언어를 선택하시면 80%는 선택하신 언어로 20%는 영어로 같이 들릴 것입니다. 그리고 오늘 저녁 이 모든 방송은 라이브 페이스북 라이브로 생방송이 되고 생중계가 되고 있습니다. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Marisela Castro. Yo soy su intérprete inglés español. Esta junta comunitaria está siendo grabada y también está siendo transmitida en vivo para escuchar toda esta junta en español. En la parte de abajo, en un momento, se va a activar el botón de los diferentes idiomas para escucharla en español. Presione el botón de español y de esa manera usted va a estar escuchando mi voz al 80% de volumen y lo que se diga en inglés al 20%. Usted va a estar entonces en el canal de español. Gracias. Mi nombre es Marisela Castro. Ok, Dr. Braverin. Well, thank you, Ms. Wynn, and thank all of you for being here tonight at our community town hall. I am Scott Braverin, your superintendent, and we want to welcome all of you from all of our backgrounds, all of our communities to this very important town hall. We've committed throughout the pandemic to come to you through various town halls to update you on the latest information around the pandemic and to give you an opportunity to ask questions and get answers to your questions to the very best of our ability. 
We are committed as we have been since the pandemic began and we will as we move out of this pandemic and we will move out and through this pandemic together to continue to come to you as a community and as a school system and share with you the latest information we have, the rationale behind what we are doing and why we're doing it and to take your questions and address concerns to the very best of our ability. I do want to take a moment to tell you about some very special guests that are joining me today. We're gonna to go over for a few slides of content and then take questions, but I do have some special guests with me today uh, that you'll be hearing from either through the slide presentation or during the question and answer period. We have Dr. Michelle Boyd, our assistant superintendent for special services with us today. Dr. Nardis King, our interim chief equity officer here in Fairfax County Public Schools. Dr. Benjamin Schwartz, who's the director of epidemiology and population health at Fairfax County's health department. And Dr. Schwartz joined us for numerous town halls around the pandemic, and we appreciate him returning for us this evening. And Dr. Russell Libby, who is one of our local pediatricians, part of the Virginia Pediatric Group. We're glad to have all of these folks with us this evening. I wanna to begin to you, I know you've heard from me through various messages, if we can go to the next slide. I welcome you and I welcome you with a simple message. As our children return to schools tomorrow for in-person instruction, and we are proud of having five days of in-person instruction since the school year began with over 99.5% of our students back in school in person. And we have been successful throughout this pandemic this year and not having to close a single school due to COVID transmission. Our COVID transmission rates have been extremely low, less than one half of 1%. And so my message to the community has been for the last several months, including over winter break, and as we've emerged from uh, winter break with the surge, and yes, even with the governor's latest executive order, my message to you remains a simple one. Stay the course. We must stay the course here in FCPS and continue to utilize the safety mitigation strategies around the COVID-19 um, pandemic that have allowed us to continue to have a school environment that is safe for students and for our staff. I want to be clear as we begin tonight, we all seek an end to this pandemic. We all seek a transition to a different phase. And I hope that phase, that new phase is on the horizon. We all seek a moment when we can go to creating mass optional conditions. But now is not the time at the greatest surge that we've ever had in the pandemic. Now is the time to stay the course. And I hope you'll hear this message to, uh, tonight from my heart, from my soul as an educator of over almost 30 years since I first came to Fairfax County Public Schools. I remain committed to our students and to our staff and to our parents, to our entire community. We need to be thinking about the needs of everyone as we continue forward. And that's our hope that tonight You'll listen with open minds and open heart, and we'll continue to have an open door here for you at FCPS. So I wanna to turn to the next slide that will allow you to uh, see exactly what we're doing in terms of the context for COVID-19 uh, and what we're currently uh, doing uh, around that context. And to do that and to share the information, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Michelle Boyd, as I said, our assistant superintendent, for special services. Dr. Boyd. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand, and good evening to our Fairfax community. As Dr. Braybrand has shared, we are fortunate enough that despite the surge in cases that we've seen over the last couple of weeks, FCPS has been able to remain open to all schools because of our layered prevention strategy. As you see in the graph and the chart displayed to the right of the screen, Fairfax County, as with all of the other counties across the Commonwealth are experiencing high levels of community transmission. And the category or classification of high is the highest level of community transmission as we look at our COVID cases and our percent positivity. But despite our being in high community transmission, we have had zero outbreaks 
reflecting transmission in schools reported to date since we returned from winter break, and we've only had 36 outbreaks since we've come back for the 21-22 school year. Those 36 outbreaks reflect 155 cases, which as Dr. Brayran shared earlier this evening, is less than a half of a percent when you look at the over 200,000 students and staff in FCPS schools. We know that this is not something that is done in isolation. This is a manifestation of the work of our students, our staff, and our families working collaboratively to ensure a safe and healthy learning environment for all. And again, we're excited that we're able to report that despite the surge in cases that we've seen in our community. And we're encouraged, as Dr. Braybrand said, for a time when our transmission would decrease and we would be able to make some shifts. Now we've talked about our community transmission and now we want to look for a moment at what the health officials are saying regarding masking during this time. As we look at the next slide, we'll see what the CDC says and what our local health departments say regarding masking. The CDC continues to encourage universal masking for K-12 schools for students and staff ages two and above, regardless of one's vaccination status at this time. And so again, for those persons who are fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated or not vaccinated, the recommendation from our federal health authorities that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is that everyone wear masks at this time. And you'll see that that was a recent update as of January 14th. Similarly, our local health department partners, and we do have um, as Dr. Braybrand shared, Dr. Benjamin Schwartz here from the Fairfax County Health Department. But Fairfax County Health Department continues to recommend universal masking in public indoor settings during high levels of community transmission. And you'll see that again, that includes both those persons who are fully vaccinated and those who are not in public indoor settings. And again, that's a current update as of January 19th. So as we see both at the federal level and at the local level, when looking at high levels of community transmission, universal masking indoors is recommended. We also have some additional partners here with us that we want to talk to. and We also follow their guidance as we inform and make our decisions here in Fairfax County Public Schools. So on the next slide, we'll look at some guidance that was given from the Northern Virginia Health Directors provided to the respective superintendents in the area and recommendations from the Virginia chapter of AAP. The Northern Virginia Health Directors recommended to their Virginia superintendents for their localities, and they talked about the importance of universal masking during high transmission. Similarly, the Virginia chapter of AAP continues to strongly recommend that children wear masks in schools when infection is high. So you'll see that across levels, across organizations, as we work collaboratively with our health officials, the recommendation is consistent and the recommendation is clear. At this time, with high levels of community transmission, universal masking is recommended. We now want to talk to some local things that we've done within FCPS as it relates to mask guidance. So if we move on to the next slide, we'll look very closely at how our students have done. We wanna take this opportunity to thank all of you here, our parents, guardians, other support members, community members, and especially our students and our staff. Our students and staff as shown by this pie chart, our students have been compliant with the face mask regulations. Despite the challenges that wearing a face mask may be, and the change in the way of life that we've all experienced over the past two years, you can see that by and large, all of our students are wearing face masks and wearing them consistently. Certainly students have had to be reminded to pull your face mask up and potentially to wear it appropriately as we all have to have reminders. But by and large, we wanna celebrate that FCPS students have stepped up and have answered the call to keep themselves safe, to keep their friends safe, and to keep their community safe. So we want to take this time and say thank you to our students. When we go next, while we celebrate our mask compliance, and we've done a great job this year and our students have worn the mask, we know that we still have to create plans and processes if we have challenges with face mask compliance. So as we move to the next slide, we've developed a process to help support students 
and to foster compliance and work with redirecting students should we have any challenges with face mask compliance. FCPS is grounded in a caring culture, and we do that with everything that we do and with everyone that we work with, all of our stakeholders. And so if we have challenges with students with face mask compliance, we will continue to do that in a caring manner and in our caring culture. So as you'll see here, this is our redirection or support plan for students if we have to redirect students to wear face masks in school. Again, we would have our staff that are working directly with students to in a caring culture in a, in a respectful way to redirect students and encourage them to wear their face masks. If there are still challenges with compliance after that redirection with that particular staff member, then we would solicit the support of our student service personnel, so school counselors, social workers, psychologists, to again engage in dialogue and to work with our students to get them to comply with the face mask regulation in FCPS. And if we still need some additional support, we would then engage with our parents and guardians to have a conversation as to how we might be able to support the student and wearing a face mask. We're again, reminding that the safety of the student and the safety of others is paramount as we proceed with in-person learning in FCPS. If we've exhausted this tiered approach to redirecting and supporting students in a positive and a caring cultural way, students who would not comply would be excluded from in-person instruction as our face mask regulation is a part of our dress code that is connected to our students' rights and responsibilities. Again, we celebrate that our students have done a phenomenal job as shown on our slide before. And we know that we can continue to work collaboratively to keep that good track record moving forward for the health and safety of all. If we move to the next slide. At this time, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Brabrand or to Ms. Wynn to facilitate questions. Thank you first, Dr. Brabrand. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Boyd, for that great summary uh, of really the context for our health uh, situation right now here in FCPS and our approach that we've been doing with students all through this year and a successful approach in working with our students in a caring way. I do want to also just acknowledge uh, that today, and many of you know, uh, and we shared that we did, along with some other school divisions, six others, did file a legal challenge today around the executive order from the governor saying that the decision around masking uh, in schools is a local one enshrined in our state constitution that vests authority for the operation of schools with school boards. We also shared concerns around the executive order in relation to already passed state law through Senate Bill 1303 that says we should be providing in-person instruction in accordance with CDC guidelines and recommendations. In the end, we will respect the legal process and we are confident that we have a strong legal case. But our focus remains on the health and safety of our students and staff. We are here all as educators and parents uh, because we care about young people. We care about their future education. We care about their academics and their social emotional uh, skills, and we care about their health and safety. So we are going to continue to stay the course, work with our health authorities, uh, including some of the ones that are here with us tonight to help guide us, to continue to help guide us through this pandemic. And yes, to get us to a place where the opportunity for mask options are available. But as I said at the beginning, now at the height of the number of cases uh, per 100,000, the largest ever we've seen in FCPS, now is not the time while we remain in high COVID transmission. We will work together with them and produce a roadmap that can help all of us because we're all eager for the time when we can have more flexible mitigation strategies and more options, including options for mask wearing. But now is not the time. We are here to answer questions and to get feedback on any of the information you heard today or over the last several uh, weeks from FCPS. And I am going to turn it over to Ms. Wynn, who will work in facilitating 
uh, the remaining uh, part of the town hall. So thank you all for listening to the information and we will proceed. We do want to remind you to try to look at questions that are for the good of the group as opposed to a very, very individual question, which we can work to uh, get you answers by working uh, with a uh, respective um, assistant superintendent from each of our five regions. And we are focused today, of course, on our health and safety approach for um, returning kids to school this coming week. So over to you, Ms. Wynn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Graybrand. So um, we have already turned on the chat function, which will be visible to the panelists. And I already see hands raised, so you are already set with that. Um, just keep in mind, we have a little over, well, exactly 3,800 people on with us right now. So we are not going to be able to get to everyone, but we do want to hear from as many of you as possible. So we are asking you to please limit your question to just one question. And also, please remain polite and respectful, um, particularly as we do have students joining us this evening. So let's, um, let's start with William Pakula. William? Hi there. Hi, real quick, and I just typed my question in uh, uh, chat as well. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen in a number of states that um, anti-mask parents and protesters and purported activists have, you know, uh, uh, embarrassingly harassed students and parents and even staff while walking to school, while entering school grounds, uh, while waiting for buses. Uh, has the school district made any preparation to try and limit the extent to which any of that, God forbid, can happen uh, in Fairfax County? Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, listen, we are all committed to being sure that we have a safe and inclusive community, including at all of our schools. Um, I'm really confident that our community will continue to understand the rationale behind our approach uh, and work with us over the next several weeks and months uh, as we continue through this pandemic. We certainly continue to work with our principals and our Office of School Safety and Security. Uh, and we continue to have strong relationships with our Fairfax County Police Department. As you know, we have an SRO in all of our middle and high schools, and we have relationships between our police department and our elementary schools, should there be a serious incident. But frankly, I call on everybody listening to this town hall tonight to remain calm, to continue to stay the course, and to know that while we might have differences of opinion, around mask wearing, we are still one community, one Fairfax, and we need to come together for the benefit of our students and that uh, this issue will be ultimately resolved by the courts, which is what happens sometimes when different branches of government believe that they have the authority. And we do believe, I know some questions in the chat earlier, why are you continuing to do this, Dr. Brady Brand? There's an executive order there is a hierarchy of law that starts with constitutional law. The state constitution grants the authority for operation of the school board uh, in the state constitution. It's not granted anywhere else. In addition, the executive order is in the hierarchy of laws below state statutory law. The state passed a law last year, Senate Bill 1303, requiring that schools open for five days in person and to the maximum extent practicable follow CDC recommendations. CDC recommendations continue to say mass wearing should happen as Dr. Boyd shared on an earlier slide, regardless of vaccination status. We believe we need to continue to follow um, the, the, the state law and we need to continue to look at the state constitution that vests authority for the operation of schools in school boards. They are the chief executive officers locally for the operation of the school. They can direct the superintendent and they give me the opportunity to have the privilege and honor of day-to-day -day responsibility for operating the school system. So we need to continue to let our school boards uh, support our students and faculty in our community by keeping our kids and our 
staff safe during the pandemic. So let's go to the next question. And again, thank you for that question. I am confident we will have a positive outcome tomorrow uh, that is grounded in our caring culture and support for everyone. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Caitlin Brown. Hi, yes, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, given that the CDC recently said that cloth masks are not effective, how do you uh, plan to follow that guidance into the future? I guess my question is, if you are actually planning to build your requirements around current CDC guidance, is the requirement going forward going to be for students to wear surgical or N95 masks, or are you going to continue to require cloth masks even though the CDC says that they are not effective? Dr. Boyd, thank you for that great question. Dr. Boyd, do you or one of our panelists want to talk a little bit about the latest CDC guidance on masks that was issued uh, and uh, provide some additional uh, feedback for the questioner? Certainly, and thank you, Dr. Braybrand. I'll provide some feedback and then I certainly will um, open the floor to our, our medical panelists um, who have the expertise in that area. Um, and thank you so much, um, for the question regarding masks. The CDC did recently release some information as it related to the effectiveness of masks and essentially they tiered masks um, where in essence they indicated that um, N95 and KN95 masks had the highest levels of protection um, followed by this disposable mask. Um, but one of the things that they emphasized that was really, really important that they said was the fit and the appropriate fit and usage of the mask and wearing the mask consistently and correctly. The CDC, CDC indicated that despite the mask that's, that's selected, it's that close fit. You want the mask to fit very close to your face so that particles can't get in or get out. And so we understand that um, some persons will want to wear, whether they double mask, whether they loop the mask behind their ear, whether they wear mask brace, different things to improve the fit of the mask. Um, we are looking at providing some additional um, masks, some KN95s for a small select um, number of staff persons who work with students who potentially can't wear masks and have those medical mask exemptions and have some um, in, 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 in environments in which there is more likely to have um, some, some transmission or droplets exchange. But by and large, the CDC emphasized the appropriate fit and consistent and correct usage of the mask as being one of the important things. Um, but I do want to open up the floor to our physicians to provide and our health partners to provide any feedback on masks um, to share with the group as well. Dr. Schwartz, would you like to begin? What, what I would emphasize is that the CDC document talks about the importance of a mask fitting well and a mask having multiple layers and a mask that a child will wear effectively and consistently. While N95s and KN95s have a higher filtering ability, um, if they don't fit or if children don't wear them consistently, they would not be effective. And so CDC wasn't recommending that children not wear cloth masks but rather that they wear the best mask with the best filtering capacity that they can wear consistently, effectively, and without any gaps around the sides. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Dr. Libby, one of the things I've just gotten to see, I know so much floats out around in uh, media and social media. I did see a uh, message that went out from a local pediatrics group uh, around masking just the other day. Um, and it had some studies cited both here in the United States, as well as studies that have been conducted around the world around the efficacy of masks to reduce transmission. Um, do you want to talk at all about where the pediatricians are here locally in Fairfax County and across the state are around this issue of mask wearing at school? and? maybe speak to uh, some good places folks can go to learn more about the studies that really form or inform the recommendation to wearing masks. Well, I'm here as a pediatrician who has 40 plus years of experience and has been uh, more or less uh, 
standard in this county for uh, as long as uh, as most can remember if they have kids. Um, and I represent the Virginia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as being aware of the policies and um, and the intent of uh, of all of us in the pediatric health care community, which is to basically protect kids, to protect their families, to protect our communities. And it is clear that there is a benefit to be had from wearing masks. And many can argue how much that benefit might be, uh, what the material might be like, what the, the, the fit might be like. Obviously, the higher the quality and the better known filtering capacity, as well as the better the fit, yeah, you're going to get better protection. But with kids, they scream, they yell, they laugh, they talk, they sing, they do all the things that will generate the flow of, uh, of potentially infected or virus carrying uh, particles in their breath that will be there for others to catch. And wearing that mask is most prominently intended to help reduce the spread from someone who's asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, but carrying that virus that might then infect someone else who would go home and infect their family, their grandparents, or anyone else without them even being aware of it. Certainly having the recipient wearing a mask adds to that protection, but it's not always the quality of that fabric that makes all the difference. It's being aware of that distance, being aware of that protection, that layer, that, that element of, of protection that will help to reduce that. You know, in the first year of the pandemic, close to 190,000 kids lost a parent or a custodial grandparent. That was just in the first year. And we're seeing four times the number of cases coming out at this time of year, especially with kids who are in school. The whole attitude has to be one, how can we reduce the likelihood of that happening? And kids, when they are in the middle of these settings, they really, they really carry a significant burden that we impose upon them by questioning and trying to undermine the real public health that, that all of us are here to advocate. Kids carry that kind of guilt if they think they brought something home to their families that infected someone, that killed someone. Uh, you know, the, the potential for harm is so much greater than the potential for good. I think that's the most important thing that you can take away from this. Thank you, Dr. Livy. And uh, Ms. Wynn, I'll turn it back over to you and see if there's some additional questions. Um, and I know folks who are hoping that we can get some more questions in and we'll try to be uh, as succinct as we can in our answers so that folks can ask more questions. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have received a lot of questions around um, when would we be developing specific criteria to determine that it is time to roll back on the mask mandate. Yeah, we are in the process of working with our health authorities around what that roadmap would look like. Um, we are beginning again to engage in that conversation. I know Maryland, just across the river from us, has been looking at a set of varying medical metrics, health metrics, to help determine when a school or community can go mask optional. So we're going to be really looking at that with our local health authorities to come up with a roadmap that we can share soon. Again, now is not the time. This is the highest surge we've ever had in the pandemic for COVID transmission. But we do want to share that roadmap as soon as we can, because I think part of the frustration is people want to know what is a marker? When can this be over? And uh, we're committed. I am committed to you all tonight, those of you who feel very strongly about when that time is coming and we all strongly feel we want that time to come but those of you who feel very strongly about mass optional we will work to develop that roadmap with um, our local health authorities and health authorities from around uh, the country um, as soon as possible and communicate that uh, to the school board with the school board with transparency uh, so that folks can know uh, our approach as we move forward Sorry about that. Another question is around uh, mask wearing in our school buses. And has there been any um, direction given to bus drivers on what they can do or should do if they have a student uh, attempting to get on the bus without wearing a mask? 
Yeah, I do want to remind everybody, the governor's executive order does not cover masks on school buses. Mask on school buses remains a federal requirement. All school districts in Virginia remain under a mandate for students to wear masks. FCPS policy this year has not prevented a child from being transported from a bus stop to school who is not wearing a mask. But that child, when they are getting off the bus, will work with local school leadership uh, to um, receive the message that masks need to be worn while on the bus and need to be worn as they come into the school for classroom instruction. So we're going to continue that policy and procedure just as we have all year. Um, we are going to ask students to comply with uh, our mask wearing uh, regulations. Uh, and we uh, are uh, expecting our families uh, to support, again, federal law for having their kids wear masks on the bus and then continuing to support our um, operating policies and procedures around mask wearing in schools. Thank you. Uh, let's see, we have Nestor Lopez with his hand raised. Nestor? Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, yes, I, I just had a quick input on, on this subject. My son currently assists uh, to a Fairfax County um, school. And I'm very concerned because, you know, I feel that this mandate on masks, I get this, you know, everybody has a different point of view on, 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 on this subject. And I feel that this, this is coming more to, you know, it's, I feel like the county is taking our kids' rights to choose on whether they want or, or not to wear a mask and taking, you know, the rights from our, us parents, whether this is something that's going to benefit our kids or not. Not every kid is the same. If you have kids, and you understand what I'm saying. And, and it, it, it frustrates me a lot, you know, not every kid has the same health conditions. I understand that every kid is different my kids are different everybody else's kids are different but this is going farther than what it needs to be as far as uh, this mandate for masks you're taking our kids right to choose and i don't feel that is right i don't feel that is correct you know no nestor i really appreciate that because that's a perspective uh that we need to hear and understand the feedback first of all we do have an opt-out for medical reasons and for religious reasons for masks I think part of the pandemic that's particularly hard for people is to balance my individual right for how I want my child to go to school with that, with that uh, individual rights impact on the rights of other children who also have a right to go to school and to go to school in a safe environment. And the pandemic has required a, uh, an amount of collective sacrifice for our community, for our country, for our world. And, and, you know, this is something people had hoped would be over after a couple of weeks, then a couple of months. And now we're almost uh, to two years and it's very frustrating. I'm frustrated too. I want to see the COVID cases go down, but I also believe our responsibility is to all of our students. And we have to do the appropriate balancing of, of individual rights. Our whole country was formed really on this balancing act of individual rights and uh, balancing those with the rights of others. And I have a right to do things up until the ability that that, that right impinges or infringes on the rights of others. And the pandemic is really um, just a primary example of how my decision not to wear a mask uh, or not to get vaccinated has a huge effect on what happens to others. And um, I think that's why it remains uh, an issue that creates so much uh, comment and commentary. And um, we've got to continue to move forward and try to bring everybody together. I do hope we're near the last phase of this pandemic, uh, but in this last phase, which I hope we are in, we are at the highest rates and we need to stay the course and follow the science and our health authorities to get us through 
And that's what we're going to continue to do in FCPS. Some people have asked about the legal challenge. I hope that it will be quick. I know the governor says that he will respect the legal process and we will respect the legal process. And I hope that we will have this resolved very soon. And I am confident that we have the appropriate legal uh, arguments for why uh, we will uh, be uh, found correct in the court of law. We're going to continue to go forward, though, and focus on the caring culture that we've been talking about all year long uh, and the focus on the health and safety of our students and staff. Uh, Tracy, we'll turn it back over to you and see if there's uh, some additional questions folks that would want to ask. Sure, let's go to Jamie Stahl. I'm pronouncing that correctly. Jamie. Okay, I'm not sure that we you may have Is there to maybe some maybe somebody else and we can come back to Jamie in yes. a few minutes. I was just looking to see if we found her. Okay, yes. Why don't we go with um, Carrie O'Leary? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, I feel like I have a good understanding of these concepts um, being a public health professional myself, but I was just wondering if um, you all could explain to the broader audience how masking is more effective when everyone is wearing them and also the repercussions of if we did do optional masking, the repercussions um, that would kind of fall out in terms of absences and classes potentially having to shut down, teachers not being available because they're sick, um, and all of those potential repercussions of not having masks, uh, not having a mask mandate. Uh, Dr. Schwartz, do you want to start with a response to that question and then maybe some others can uh, add in? So masks are most effective when everyone wears them because a large way that masks protect our children is by trapping any secretions that they're breathing out or they're coughing and thereby protecting other people. So when everyone wears a mask, we are all protecting each other from COVID. Um, we know that this is an effective approach um, because the number of cases that we've seen in our school, the number of outbreaks, the amount of transmission that has occurred at schools has been very, very low, both here in Fairfax as well as nationwide. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz. Um, Tracy, do we have some additional questions? Yes, let's see. Dr. Um, Roybrand, I think Dr. Libby has his hand up to share. Oh, he does. He does. Thank you. Yeah, and I just want to add, yes, it's, it's clear that everyone needs to wear masks to maximize the potential reduction in spread. And if you look around the community right now, it may not be apparent to you, but there really is still a lot of spread ongoing. And I see it every day uh, in my patient population that there was an index in a classroom that tested positive, often not with a symptomatic positivity, but we know that with this Omicron strain that the contagiousness starts before symptoms start. And it's it's just hard for people to grasp this concept that there are sick people out there. COVID does create a long-term condition in way too many people. And we don't even know what that iceberg looks like under the water right now. We're still in the, in the early stages of understanding this. It is imperative that people conceptualize that this is the best way we need to do the best we can to protect ourselves, our families, and each other. Thank you. Uh, let's see, moving to the chat. Um, I've seen a couple of questions around lunchtime in the cafeterias and wondering if there will be any um, changes to going back to social distancing at lunchtime. Yeah, thank you, Tracy. You know, lunch has always been one of our challenges since the beginning of the pandemic. 
Uh, it's been one of the things that when we started this year, we said we weren't going to be able to social distance and bring everybody back 99.5% of our kids. So we did a lot during lunch this year to keep our COVID transmission low. We asked kids to eat outside whenever possible. We staggered our lunches. We separated kids into uh, more spots across the school facility for lunches. Um, we provided plexiglass in many of our schools, especially uh, in our elementary schools for kids. And we've continued to be very successful uh, around our lunchtime. The one thing, the CDC guidance that had come out just a few weeks ago said that kids would have uh, their recommendation, the ability to return uh, for day six through 10, but would need to be kept six feet apart during lunch. And in a division of this size with 180,000 kids and lunches with sometimes anywhere from five to 700 kids in each lunch, we did not believe that would be operational for a system this size to identify those kids in day six through 10 and keep them six feet apart from their peers. So uh, that is the one piece that we're continuing to have those kids um, uh, return on after 10 days as opposed to five days. Um, and we are gonna, again, continue to do everything we can to keep that lunchtime as very uh, safe as possible. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, another question from the chat. Can you expand on the ability to have a religious mask exemption? Just some wonderings around the exemptions. If you could go over that again, please. Well, there are uh, exemption processes on place. That information is available on our, our, our website around uh, health exemptions for uh, or medical exemptions for masks and religious exemptions. And I would just call people to the website if they have additional questions, uh, they can uh, certainly let us know. And, you know, we'll certainly try to um, to honor those uh, as best we can. Uh, Dr. Boyd, is there anything else that you would uh, share around that? Again, I believe all that information is available on our website. That's correct. The only thing I would add is that if you, um, if families are considering, um, a, believe that their child has a medical mask exemption or a religious mask exemption, that they would submit that information to their schools and that will be funneled to the appropriate um, place for, um, for processing and consideration. Okay, thank you. Um, and so Jamie Stahl that we tried to reach, uh, who we tried to reach earlier, we believe she is available now. If you can track her down. Hi. Great, hi Jamie. Hi, um, I'm just wondering, there's been some recent studies that I've read lately that are showing that there's no statistical difference in community transmission between mask required schools and schools that do not require masks. So if that's shown in, I've seen two separate studies saying that, um, why are we still requiring masks if that's the case? Dr. Lever, Dr. Dr. Schwartz, I, I don't know the study she's referring to. And uh, as I was sharing uh, earlier, I think there are several studies the CDC has released both locally or domestically and internationally around the uh, impact of mass uh, wearing. And maybe, maybe as we answer this question, I think something that's come up here, people are citing different studies suggesting different conclusions to mask. And I think this is one of the things that continues to stir the community uh, here and across our country. And you all as, as practitioners, is there anything that we can tell our community tonight as they continue to look for and find different research that has uh, different pieces of information to share? Well, I'll, I'll pop in there just saying that often you will find studies that are magnified to significance by those who have an intention to use it uh, to support their position. Uh, the vast majority of evidence is that mask wearing and in particular in social settings, uh, in group settings, will reduce the likelihood of transmission. There are many variabilities relative to the materials, uh, the fashion with which they are fitted, and the cooperation on a continuing basis in those settings. 
uh, it's hard to draw strict conclusions. There's a lot that's evolving, but the, the best advice that can be given is that still masks are the way to go, that they help significantly reduce the likelihood of transmission. The other thing that I did forget to mention, which was asked earlier, was that uh, there is a decent website from the American Academy of Pediatrics called healthychildren.org. And it really does translate a lot of the information from the science to what is much more understandable for those who want to read it with references, with uh, links to all kinds of more scientific level, uh, if that's what people desire to read through. But the long and the short of it is that there will always be someone who will try to point to a controversy that will undermine uh, the best public health approach. And currently the best, best public health approach is to wear masks in these group settings as best you can. And, and there, there have been a number of good studies that have been published showing that masks are effective in reducing the amount of COVID disease compared with school districts that are not mandating masks. There are studies from Florida, from Arizona. There was a national study that was done. A study in Georgia showed a 21% decrease in disease and in um, districts where masks were mandated, although that difference was not statistically significant. And there are also studies from North Carolina, from Wisconsin, from Utah, as well as other states showing that masks as part of a layered strategy for prevention have been effective in keeping schools safe and keeping transmission of disease in schools very low and in fact, lower than we see in the community as a whole. Thank you. And I see some in the chat, Tracy. I think, uh, um, I think Dr. Um, I think Dr. Libby shared the uh, website was healthychildren.org. Healthychildren.org. Is that correct, Dr. Libby? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Libby, your hand is actually still raised. Did you want to add anything else? No? <laughs> okay, no worries. Um, One of the things, see. if I could just finally on yeah. mask, I know there's the whole argument of show me the studies. I just want to be completely candid. Look around this country and look around even Virginia earlier this year. Multiple school districts closed multiple schools for multiple days. Fairfax County has not closed a single school for a single day. And that's a fact that all of you have been able to experience. Even during the surge, we've emptied out our central office to cover because we know that in-person instruction is the most important instruction there is. We have maintained extremely low COVID transmission because we have committed to high vaccination rates to having a mandatory vaccination policy for our staff, for mandating our athletes to get vaccination, and for doing as much as possible to follow the CDC guidelines to the maximum extent practicable in the Senate Bill 1303 state law, including universal masking, which we were doing even before Governor Northam uh, issued his executive order to school districts. We're doing the right thing so that we can continue our primary mission as a school district, which is to provide in-person instruction for students. And we want to continue to do that. We also want to continue to get to that day when there are more options and there is more flexibility, but that day isn't now. And as I said earlier, I will commit to continuing to work with our health authorities to get us a roadmap so that we can uh, know what the metrics are, what the health metrics are that will allow us to have some additional flexibility when it comes to masking. Uh, another question from the chat, has FCPS considered monitoring CO2 levels in schools to ensure we have sufficient ventilation and air cleaning in place? Would you be able to take that one, Dr. Brown? Yeah, you know, we didn't bring Mr. Plannenberg tonight. He was a yeah. uh, regular on some of our other town halls. We have upgraded our help, uh, help HEPA filters. Um, we have done checks on our entire HVAC system to look at the exchange of air rates 
that are recommended for classrooms. And Mr. Plattenberg has assured me we are over and above the national standard for the air exchange in rooms, which is the amount of fresh air that comes in and out over a certain period of time. We'll continue to monitor that as we move forward because we know air quality indoors is an important part of trying to limit COVID transmission in our schools. Uh, let's take a, another question from Joan Goldfarm. Joan? Hi. Uh, yes, Hi. I'm, I had to unmute. I, I just wanted to, to thank you for staying the course. Uh, I have a child in the school system and I've been really worried about her going into the schools uh, without universal masking. So I really, really appreciate that you are staying the course. I trust that the scientists know what they're doing. And I recognize people want to have feel that they need to make a decision for their child, but they seem to uh, forget that when they make that decision for their child not to wear a mask, they're also making a decision for my child to be exposed to the to the germs that their child might might be spreading. So I am very thankful for what you're doing. Well, well, thank you, Ms. Goldfarb. And listen, I acknowledge how tough this balance is. This is really, you know, I, I, I think about Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we all want to pursue happiness. And this pandemic has caused us to balance life, life itself, with liberty which is what we conceived our nation in when we created this public republic. And this is the tension between the life we want for all of our citizens, even as this pandemic has raged and caused uh, more fatalities and casualties uh, already, I think three times the amount than what we've experienced during World War II in wartime casualties. If this were a war, this is one of the most significant uh, attacks on our country that we've ever endured. And so we are facing that challenge between life and liberty that is fundamental rooted in our own, our own origin story as a country. I'm confident that we can continue to stay together, to work together and to communicate the very latest in science and health and get us through this pandemic. I do hope we are at a turning point with, um, with the pandemic. And I'm just going to commit to you as I continue uh, to finish my final year as superintendent and my final year of over a span of 30 years in Fairfax County to work with all of you to listen, whether you agree with me or not, that I'm coming to you with a, a humble heart, with a servant's heart to, to support your kids to support our staff that support your kids. And we didn't talk a lot about that tonight, but there are a lot of staff members who've written me who are saying, I won't be back Dr. Braybrand if we just pull mask off for any old reason. And we need to be thinking about not just the instruction our kids get this week or next week or next month, but next year as well. We need to continue to create the conditions for the very finest teachers and counselors and principals and support staff to be a part of the school system and that they believe we are going to continue to be reasonable. We're going to continue to listen and learn from all of the, the leadership in our country, the medical leadership and the science leadership to help navigate us through this pandemic. And I, I continue to, uh, offer to everyone my deepest thoughts and prayers for us to continue to come together as a community uh, as hard as it's been as frustrating as it's been everybody has a right to feel angry about the pandemic and what it has caused us to sacrifice and i just simply say to you now is not the time now is not the time to change our course it's to stay the course and we can together as a community get through this Omicron surge, get to the other side and work together to find a way uh, out of the pandemic and in 
to a, a, a new post-pandemic age that really, really creates new opportunities for our students and staff. And I just thank you all for your time tonight. And uh, we'll look to find additional time to communicate with you in the weeks uh, and months ahead uh, as we continue through this school year. Um, thank you all so much. I wanna thank Dr. Boyd. And Dr. Boyd, you wanna wave your hand and Dr. Livy. Um, Dr. Schwartz, thank you for coming. And uh, Ms. Gwynn, can we have all of our interpreters just give them a big thank you for being here to be accessible for all the folks who speak different languages. But uh, tonight, I wanna end that our language is one of mutual respect, mutual trust, and love for our kids, love for our young people. We're here because we care and we will together come through this stronger than ever before with your help and support and with your grace. I do ask for grace tomorrow and for the days ahead. And I thank you for being here this evening. Have a great time and we'll see you really soon. Bye-bye everybody.